Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1060, Trigonometry for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture 19, we're going to talk about the half angle identities, which are related to the double angle identities we talked about in lecture 18. In fact, it's essentially, essentially the half angle identities are the double angle identities worked backward. So what do we mean by that? Well, let's first take a look at them. So in this video, we're going to talk about the half angle identities for sine and cosine. And so if you take sine of a over two, where a is any angle, and you're, so you're considering half of that angle. So we go from like a 30 degree angle to a 15 degree angle. Sine of a over two is going to equal plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of a over two where this plus or minus, as we've seen before, uh, is dependent upon the quadrant that we're in. Um, uh, you know, our sine's gonna be positive in the first and second quadrant, it'll be negative in the third and fourth quadrant. So without knowing the quadrant, we can't predict the sign, we can get the absolute value here. Uh, so we will need some information about the quadrant to proceed forward. Uh, similar for cosine here, cosine of a over two is gonna equal plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine a over two. You'll notice that the half angle identity for sine and cosine are almost identical. You get plus or minus the square root of one plus or minus cosine of a over two. The only difference is in this sign right here. The half angle identity for cosine has a plus in front of the cosine and has a negative in front of the cosine for sine. And this goes with the usual uh, the usual analogy, we, or not an analogy, but the mnemonic device we had before that cosine's a jerk, right? Cosine gets along with cosine, but cosine and sine, they kind of butt heads a little bit there, even though sine wants to get along with cosine. So you have a negative sign right there. So where does this, where does, where do these interesting half angle identities come from? Let's consider where the half angle identity for sine comes from. To get this, we're gonna consider actually the double angle identity for cosine. Like I said, the half angle identities come from turning these double angle identities on their heads. Now with the double angle identity for cosine, there actually was three different versions of it. Cosine of two X could equal cosine squared X minus sine squared X. Uh, we're not gonna use that one right now. Uh, there's cosine of two X equals two cosine squared X minus one. So there's a version that only involves cosine. We'll use that when we do the cosine half angle, but for the sine half angle, we're going to use the version where cosine of two X equals one minus two sine squared of X right here. It only involves sine. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve for sine right here. So to start, we're going to subtract, uh, we're going to subtract one from both sides, cosine of two X minus one is equal to negative two sine squared of x. Now we're gonna divide both sides by negative two. We get that sine squared of x is equal to, well, in this situation, because we're times by negative or dividing by negative, it's gonna switch the sign on the top. So you get one minus cosine of two x like so, and this sits above two. Um, and then to solve for sine, uh, excuse me, solve for sine here, you can take the square root of both sides. Uh, you'll get the square root of one minus cosine of two x over two. And then again, because you're taking the square root, we don't know which sign is which, so we're gonna do plus or minus right here. So you're just gonna start with the observation that a equals two x, therefore x equals a halves. And you make that substitution in right here, x is equal to a halves, and then two x is equal to a. And so this gives us the half angle identity we saw right here, all right? Let's do the same thing for cosine. Uh, it, again, it's the same basic calculation. For cosine, you're gonna take cosine of two X is equal to two cosine squared X minus one. So you use the other double angle identity like we talked about. Uh, we wanna solve for just cosine of X right here. So subtract or add one to both sides, excuse me. Cosine of two X plus one equals two cosine squared of X. Uh, divide both sides by two. You get cosine squared of X is equal to here. We're gonna get one plus cosine of two X over two, and then take the square root, you get cosine of X is equal to plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of two X over two. And so using the same substitutions, you can replace the two X with an A, and you can replace the X with an A over two, thus giving us the half angle identities from before. Uh, now, why do we go through all the details of proving these formulas here? Why not just memorize them? Well, one, it can be difficult to memorize these things. Uh, so by seeing where they come from, we have a much better chance of memorizing them. And then 
in the horrible situation which we need them but we can't remember them we could actually reproduce them possibly on the fly but another important observation here is that there are alternative versions of this this one formula is not all there is in fact this equation right here is equivalent to all of these equations right here for which again this one right here is just the double angle identity we saw before so the two are really equivalent to each other if you know one you know the other but one is often more useful than another but also something we see a lot like for example in calculus some of the intermediate steps are extremely useful uh, for example you say take this one right here the way it's usually written um, is sine squared of x is equal to one half one minus cosine of two x this identity i can't emphasize enough it's 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 not the version of that it's not the half angle identity version that we're taking as the official one but this version right here is extremely useful in a calculus setting it can turn a sine squared into some type of linear combination of cosine of 2x um, alternatively this one right here same basic idea we can turn a cosine squared and so you get cosine squared of x is equal to one half one plus cosine of 2x right here uh, this one's this version of the half angle identity is the one used the most often in a calculus setting so by going through the proof we actually learned lots of identities all at once so let's actually do some practical applications with this half angle identity um, let's consider the observation that cosine of a is equal to three-fifths and we also know that angle a is between uh 270 degrees and 360 degrees and so let's then find sine of a halves cosine of a halves and tangent of a halves now you might wonder why did we say a sits between 270 degrees and 360 degrees why not just say that a belongs to the fourth quadrant well this one does imply that but the other direction is not necessarily true a could be in the fourth quadrant but its angle measured might not be inside of the domain 270 to 360. Uh, for example if you, a was equal to negative 45 degrees that's in the fourth quadrant but there's a little bit more to it and the reason this is significant has to do when you start considering half angles right uh, because if a was equal to say like negative 60 degrees which again which is in the fourth quadrant if you take half of a that's equal now to negative 30 degrees which is still in the fourth quadrant on the other hand um, if we take something like a equals 300 degrees which is in the fourth quadrant if you take half of a uh so, sorry half of a then you end up with 150 degrees which is in the second quadrant like so so with half angles if the knowing the quadrant is not good enough um, we need to know we, we it's better to know the angle measure clearly we won't always know the angle measure but if you give us some more information we can then figure things out from there so that's why it's described in this manner right here 270 to 360. all right so the half angle identity we saw for sine sine of a over two from the previous slide it was plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine right here of a over two so some things to do is since we know cosine you can do this calculation here you're going to get the square root of one minus three fifths all over two now what about the sine well this is what we were trying to think about earlier right um, if a is between 270 and 360 then what happens when we cut these things in half we know that a over two will be less than half of 360 which is 180 degrees and then a will be larger than half of 270 which is 135 degrees in particular a halves is going to be in the second quadrant that's what we need to know right here now in the second quadrant right first quadrant it's positive positive in the second quadrant it's negative positive so sine is going to be positive in this situation cosine will be negative we'll get to that in a moment so how do we do with these fractions instead of fractions not a big fan of these nested fractions here uh, let's simplify let's times the top and bottom by five uh, this is going to give us the square root of 5 minus 3 over 10 like so 5 minus 3 of course is a 2 and so then we get 2 over 10 oh I should have followed my own advice now multiply the denominators because 2 goes into the 10 5 times you're going to get the square root of 1 fifth which if you prefer you can also write this as 1 over the square root of 5 or if you prefer you can take the square root of 5 over 5 these are all equivalent to each other I think the simplest version here is actually going to be 1 over the square root of 5 so I'll take that as sine of a halves what about cosine of a halves right using the half angle identity we get plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine 
of a over 2. So in this situation, we can plug in cosine of a, which is going to be 1 plus 3 fifths all over 2. Um, since we're in the second quadrant, we're going to be negative in this situation. Uh, again, let's times top and bottom by 5 to simplify that fraction. So we end up with negative the square root of 5 plus 3 over 2 times 5. I learned my lesson that time. 5 plus 3 is equal to 8. 8 goes into 2, of course. Uh, I should say five, 2 goes into 8 four times. So we end up with negative the square root of 4 over 5, for which 4 is a perfect square. It's a 2, and then we're going to square root of 5 again. So that'll then be our cosine here. We get negative 2 over the square root of 5. And so now we're in a situation where we can compute tangent. How are we going to do the tangent? Do we have a half angle identity for tangent? There is one, but honestly, since we already have sine and cosine, we're just going to use that one, right? We don't need another one. Um, and so we're just going to take sine of a over 2, which is 1 over the square root of 5, which we saw. And then we're going to take cosine of a over 2, which is negative 2 over the square root of 5. Again, fractions inside of fractions. Um, since it's a fraction, just by, by divide a fraction, you can just think of it as multiplying by the reciprocal. You get 1 over the square root of 5 times square root of 5 over negative 2. We see that the square roots of 5 will cancel out. And so a tangent in this situation would be negative 1 half. And then we could figure out secant, cosecant, cotangent of a over 2 very easily with the values we have now collected. Let's do another example of this. This time we know sine of a is equal to negative 12 over 13. And we know that a lives between the angle measures 180 degrees and 270 degrees. So again, I'm telling you that a lives in the third quadrant, but with half angles, we need a little bit more information than that. So we're told it's 180 to 270. So if we just cut that out, cut that in half immediately, we get a halves will be larger than 90 degrees, which is half of 180. And we get that a halves is less than 135 uh, which is half of 270. So this tells us the important information that A2 is going to live inside the second quadrant again. Can we find the six trigonometric functions here? Well, to do sine of A halves and cosine of A halves, uh, we, do, we need to know cosine, right? So let's first convert from sine of A to cosine of A. And to do that, I actually like to think of right triangle diagrams. Admittedly, we're in the we're in the third quadrant, my picture, so I could draw this a little bit better, but uh, that's okay. Just think of it in terms of reference angles or something like that. Here's A and like so. Sine is opposite over adjacent. If we started off in the third quadrant, right, we have plus plus, we have minus plus, uh, we have plus minus, and in the third quadrant, everything is negative. Well, sine and cosine are negative, I should say, like so. So we, if sine of A is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, we're going to get a negative 12 right here and 13 right here. By the Pythagorean equation, the other side should have a length of 5, as we're in the second, uh, the third quadrant, excuse me, this length is going to be a negative 5. So we can then compute cosine. Cosine of A is equal to negative 5 over 13. We need to know that for the half angle identities. Okay, so now let's do them. Sine of A halves. This is going to equal in the second quadrant. A halves is in the second quadrant. Sine's positive there. We're going to get the square root of 1 minus cosine, which is negative 5 over 13, all over 2. So we have this fraction here. So let's times the top and bottom by 13. This is going to give us the square root of 13 plus 5, all over 2 times 13. Let's see what happens there for a moment. Uh, 13 plus 5 is 18, like so. 18 is divisible by 2, leaving a 9 behind. 9 over 13. 9 is a perfect square, so we're going to end up with 3 over the square root of 13. We'll, we'll describe that as sine of a halves. All right, let's use the half angle identity for cosine now. Continuing on, cosine of a halves. This is equal to, well, it's plus or minus. We're in the second quadrant for a halves, so cosine is going to be negative right there. We get the square root of 1 plus cosine, but cosine is negative uh, 5 thirteenths, like we observed, all over 2. Let's clean up this fraction again, times top and bottom by 13, giving us, of course, a negative, the square root of 13 minus 5 over 2 times 13. 13 take away 5 this time gives us an 8, so negative 8 over 2 times 13. The 2 goes into 8 4 times, so we get negative the square root of 4 over 13. 4 is a perfect square. You end up with 
negative two on top, and then we get the square root of 13 again. Uh, so this time, now that we have sine and cosine, we can find tangent, just like we did in the previous one, right? Tangent of a halves is equal to three over the square root of 13, that's sine, times, we're gonna get the square root of 13 over negative two. So that's, we're divided by cosine there, the square root, square root of 13 is taken away, and we end up with negative three halves for tangent. Um, if we wanna find cosecant of a halves, we just take the reciprocal, you get the square root of 13 over three. If you wanna find secant of a halves, you just take the reciprocal of cosine, so you get negative square root of 13 over two. And if you wanna find cotangent of a halves, we'll take the reciprocal of tangent, and we end up with a negative two thirds, like so. And so we can compute each and every one of these trigonometric ratios using the half angle identities. The critical thing is to find, of course, sine and cosine. Once you find sine and cosine, you can compute the other four trigonometric functions with ease, as we've seen many times before.